Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Warlock, Traitor's Edition. So this is a book from Drive Through RPG that I was sent that is a bit of a mashup of rules from a number of different British role-playing game systems. In particular, Fighting Fantasy. I saw some influence of that in there, as well as the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay system. So I'll boil down to a very simple, very fast um, system for running anything in a kind of medieval, human-centric fantasy universe. Here's our back cover. Welcome to Warlock. Warlock is a rules light role playing game system that aims to emulate the feeling of old school British tabletop games of wondrous and fantastical adventure. Warlock looks to reproduce this play style of its illustrious predecessors, but in a light, quick, and simple manner with a consistent rule set that is easily hackable and adaptable as desired. Before we dig into the book though, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by AnyWorld. The AnyWorld tabletop role playing system allows you to play games in any genre with minimal prep. The system is designed to be quick and flexible so that gamers with busy lives can get straight into the action. The book contains a large number of traits and abilities to bring your character to life. It also includes six adventures in various genres, a unique setting called the Outer Realm, which can be used to link genres together, and much more. Pick up the game today on Drive Through RPG and get ready to explore any world you can imagine. All right, so Warlock was written by Greg Saunders. We get into the table of contents here. Bit of an introduction to how Warlock works. Uh, it does use a D20 to resolve most things, as we will see, but it has a very fighting fantasy style uh, character sheet. In fact, you know what? Let's look at the character sheet right now because I think that gives you a pretty good sense of how things are going to work. Your two main stats are stamina and luck. So that, again, is pretty fighting fantasy, but you have a whole bunch of different adventuring skills here. And these can start at zero and slowly get all the way up to, I think, 15 or 16 is usually where they max out. And the general way that you resolve a test is that you're gonna roll a d20, add a skill, and you're gonna try and get a total of 20 or higher. So by my calculations, this means that low level characters will typically have a around a 25% chance of success if they just have a few points in one of their skills. And then by the time they're a high level character, they'll be succeeding at around 75% of the time, which is actually pretty close to how I did the math for my game Knave. You also have some career skills. I'll show you how that works when we get to it. Uh, weapons, spells, possessions, and so on. But it's pretty minimalistic, very clean and straightforward. The world of Warlock is very similar to the classic um, Warhammer fantasy old world, where it's very human-centric. You're basically in the empire. There can be dwarves, there can be elves, and so on. But most people that you're going to find are humans, and it's a pretty mud and blood type of uh, universe. Uh, you have a bunch of different beginning skills here. Um, so all skills have a level, the higher the better. Um, 10 of the skills in the sheet you can mark as level 6 right at the beginning. And then 10 more have level 5, and the rest start at level 4. So that's the lowest that you can start at is 4, which is why I say you have around a 25% chance to succeed uh, at the beginning of the game. We have a stamina stat. When it gets to 0, you're going to start taking serious injuries. There are tables for that later on. And there's also luck, which can work something like a saving throw, when all that would matter is your luck, you can roll that. Um, and that starts off with a 2d6 plus 12 for stamina and 1d6 plus 7 for your luck. Your basic uh, different races are humans, elves, dwarves, and halflings. None of these have any stat increases. It's basically just flavor, which I like. I think that works pretty well for um, different types of races in any kind of fantasy game. Otherwise, people start min-maxing it. And I really like it being more integrated into the culture of the game. I think that's a better way to do it. We start getting into our basic careers and skills here. Um, I think this could have been written a little bit better. I had to read this several times to really understand exactly how it works. And I had to look at some career examples to figure it out. Uh, but once I did, it clicked and it's pretty straightforward. I'll try and explain it as best I can. So um, here's an example of all the different skills that you can have and what they do. They're all pretty self-explanatory. But if you look at a career, so here's our careers here. What you're gonna do when you create a character is roll a bunch of dice. You're gonna roll four six-sided dice, and then each die is gonna give you a different career. So this can give you four different careers, one for each of the dice, and then you pick one of those. So you do have some choice in the matter, but you can't pick anything. Um, I like that. It's a nice balance between luck and wanting to design your own character, because maybe just the way that your character grew up in life, they weren't able to do just anything. They were forced to you know, pick things from the life paths that they were born with. So when you have a uh, actual career here, you have some skills and maximum level. So 
each of these you got small blade intimidate dodge persuasion streetwise at first when i was reading this i thought that this number was the starting level that that skill got and that's not actually how it works that's the maximum level that each one can rise to so when you're going to be getting improvements and you know level ups so to speak later on in the game and you want to increase your skills you can increase these skills these are the ones you can increase not the other ones because this is your career and these are the maximum levels you can get now you can transition into other careers which allows you to improve other uh, skills so that's how you can customize your character and that's basically all you really get. You get some equipment right here and you have some flavor that you can choose to use or not use. It's really up to you. The careers include agitator, beggar, boatman, bodyguard, bounty hunter, entertainer, footpad. I really like the art. It really does get that feel of old school British role playing, I think. Hunters, miners, initiates. Most of them are just fairly low level characters. They're not, no one um, is really high level. There are a way, there is a way to get more powerful careers, advanced careers later on, but you certainly can't get that at the beginning of the game. You have to work your way up to it. For example, you can't just be a wizard starting out. You can start out as a wizard's apprentice. Um, and then if you actually want to become a full blown wizard, that can be a aspiration that you're working your way up to. That's something I appreciate. A bunch of different traits here that you can choose for yourself to make yourself a little bit more flavorful. We have a whole bunch of different um, equipment pieces here and how much they cost. Again, nothing really fancy, but what you would expect. Some gods here, which is mostly just flavor for this particular setting. You could easily import your own gods if that's what you preferred. And we're talking about the core rules here, which I explained. If you want to do an opposed skill test, all you do is roll a d20, add your skill, and your opponent does the same thing. Whoever gets the highest wins. Very easy. You can learn the basic rules in just a couple of seconds. This points out that whenever you test your luck, you actually do lose a luck point. So your ability to win a lucky situation decreases over the course of that adventure, though I think it refills later. So improving within a career, there isn't XP for gold here or even for milestones exactly. It just says that at predetermined points uh, by the game master, typically at the end of the session, you get between three, one and three advances. So it's very vague about what the players are actually supposed to be doing. It doesn't reward any particular things. Although of course, it'd be very easy to put that into the game, right? You could say you get a advancement point for every thousand gold you recover, or you could tie it to monsters or completing missions or whatever the players wanted to do. Those advancement points that you get are then put directly onto your skills. Although of course they have that skill cap that I showed you previously. If you wanna get more stamina, what you have to do is increase your active career skill. So this is something that I haven't mentioned yet, but for example, if your character is a thief, you have, you know, a bunch of different adventure skills related to that. But you also have a career skill just called thief. And that just represents all of the other thief-like things that you would be good at that aren't necessarily encompassed on this skill list. And you can use it for anything that isn't on your normal skill list. If you want to increase your uh, career skill list, though, you want, have to increase... Um, well, it's explained in two different ways. That's one little confusing thing about this book, because I think it might be a misprint where in one part of the book, it says that your career skill is equal to the average of all of the adventuring skills for that career. But in another place, it says that your career skill equals the lowest of all of your adventuring skills for that career. So I guess you could pick which one you wanted to use. I think making it equal to the lowest one of those skills is the easiest way to do it. It's very simple and straightforward. And it's a kind of clever mechanic because that way, when you're increasing your thiefy skills, you would always want to be increasing the worst one first because that would increase your career skill, right? And then the rule is that every time your career skill goes up by one, that also increases your stamina. So this would incentivize you to not min-max as much. You always wanted to increase the, uh, shore up your weakest points, so to speak. That way you get better at being an overall thief and you get a little bit tougher. Now to change careers, it's also very straightforward. You just need five of those advancement points. I guess you have to save them up. And then you can pick a new career and start leveling up new skills. If you want to get an advanced career, and the advantage of getting an advanced career is that their level caps for their skills are much higher, right? They often go as high as 16. So if you want to get those really high skills, you want to get into an advanced career. And to do that, you have to have had at least two careers, basic ones before that point, And you need to have at least three adventuring skills at a level of 10 or more. So this can take you a while to work up to the point where you can become a major player in the setting. Some of those things include assassins, bravos, charlatans, explorers, uh, highwaymen, outlaw chief, a priest, a spy, 
a wizard, stuff like that. Combat is very straightforward. You're basically taking normal tests where you're making a combat, uh, an opposed test against an opponent. So you might roll your uh, sword skill and they roll their axe skill. And whoever gets a higher uh, result wins and you're gonna deal damage to that person. Initiative is basically randomly determined between the two sides. One side is just gonna win at random unless they obviously have the drop on the other side. And then you just go back and forth, one player or one character going from one side and then one from another back and forth until everyone is gone. One of the nice things about it using opposed roles though, is that this is a little bit like uh, Troika, which also uses a fighting fantasy-like system. Uh, even when you are attacked, you can also deal damage because whoever uh, gets the highest roll is the person who deals the damage. So this means that even if you're being ganged up on, you could still deal out a whole bunch if you're good enough and if you're lucky. One tweak to this though, is that whoever is doing the attacking does get a plus five bonus to their skill. This makes it much more advantageous to be the one on the attack than one on the defense. So everything isn't just a, a flat playing field. You want to be the aggressor in this system. Range attacks work about like you'd expect. You can roll a ranged uh, check versus their dodge roll, and you can get penalties if they're far away or if they're hard to hit because of other circumstantial reasons. You also get penalties if they're wearing shields, like minus three for a small shield and five for a large shield. We have a table here for damage that basically tells you how the different types of weapons are gonna be dishing it out. And if you have any kind of weird exotic weapons, you could probably fit it into this table pretty easily. You can also get a mighty strike, which I guess is a little bit like a critical. Uh, and to get a mighty strike, you have to have a result that is three times higher than the opposite side. You get a really big hit in and you're gonna deal double damage to them. Armor works by reducing the amount of damage that you have, and you do roll dice for that. So a light armor would reduce damage by 1d3, medium is 1d6, and heavy is 2d6. If you have a shield, that bumps up your armor rating, basically. So you have light armor and a shield, it would bump you up to 1d6. However, you can never take zero damage. You always take at least one damage. I think that's really smart. So with that rule, plus the way that in a combat someone is always hit, I think combat is going to go pretty quickly. You're not gonna have a situation where one side charges in and they all get bad rolls and no one gets hurt. In this combat, someone is always starting to bleed anytime anyone attacks anyone. That's really nice. It makes things a lot more frenetic, a lot more violent and exciting. In terms of recovering your stamina, you recover half of your lost stamina as soon as you take half an hour to catch your breath and you get the rest of it during a night's sleep. However, you do get these critical injuries that you might take after your stamina has gone to zero and you take additional damage. And those are gonna take much longer to heal. Here are some examples, and I really like how it's broken down by weapon type. So if you take slashing damage, um, you roll 1d6 plus the total negative stamina. So the more damage that has been done to you that you can't absorb with stamina, the worse things are going to get. So you might, your fingers might be sliced off, your ear is smashed, or you're hacked in the shoulder. Piercing damage, so this could be things like run through the shoulder, uh, my eye, permanent penalty of two to tests involving sight, and you're ugly to boot. You have to get a 10 or more to get stabbed through the heart and be dead. Right, 10 is always dead in each of these tables. So just getting to zero stamina doesn't kill you right away. Once you get to zero stamina, then the real pain starts until you're finally uh, bleeding out on the ground. So when it comes to magic, there's basically two paths here, the path of the priest or the path of the wizard. And the difference of these is mostly just the culture in the world. There's not a lot of mechanical difference between them. Uh, the priests implore the many gods to grant them miracles, whereas wizards demand their power from otherworldly beings, often infernal ones. They use the same spell list. The mechanics work the same way. When you cast a spell, you're going to be spending stamina. Uh, every spell has a stamina cost that you have to pay before it's attempted. And then once you attempt it, you have to actually make a check using your magical skill. And if it succeeds, good, you've cast the spell. If it fails, you've just lost some stamina for nothing. Anyone can cast spells in this game. However, the Path of the Priest or the Wizard are the only ones where you can really level up that uh, magic using spell, that magic using skill rather. And so you're actually gonna get better at it and you'll be losing less stamina from all of this spell casting. So anyone else might wanna use a spell occasionally, right in a pinch, but you don't wanna do it consistently unless you feel like you can consistently win that check. If you attempted to cast a spell and you roll a one on that test, then you potentially have miscast it. So you check uh, one more time, and if you fail again, then things get really bad and you have to roll on the miscast table. The miscast table could include things like the spell backfiring, blasting the caster across the room for 2d6 damage, or the caster's eyes turn jet black for 1d6 weeks, or their arms become covered in small scales. Sometimes it's just flavor stuff, but a lot of this stuff is more or less permanent. So over time, you're gonna become a more and more of this horrible mutated creature, and everyone will know that you've been messing around with powers that man was not meant to control. 
Here we have our list of spells, and there are 36 of them, which is uh, great for this type of old school game. We roll a 2d6 to figure out what spells you might want. Uh, alarm, anti-magic, befriend, blast. Most of the uh, stamina costs range for, from three to five or six is the general range for those. I like how the descriptions are short, they're punchy, it's clear what they do, and any edge cases the game master can just make a ruling. That seems to be the best way to do magic, in my opinion. Once you try and really lock down how exactly how everything works, then it becomes just kind of a pain. We have a bestiary here that is built in and a whole bunch of different monster abilities that you can use. And the stat blocks are very uh, easy to use. You have a demon, for example, has their type, how many actions per round they get, uh, what their weapons and armor look like, how many skills they get, uh, what their stamina is, and any notes that you might use. So you can write up your own monster stat blocks really quickly, should you so desire. The last thing we get at the back of the book is a section on game mastery, and it covers most of the basics, and it has a summary that you can use to pitch to your players. There's nothing really advanced or groundbreaking, I would say, in terms of uh, how to run this type of game, but it does cover the basics for anyone who is relatively new to role-playing. And that is about it. There's our uh, character sheet at the back for Warlock. So as usual, I will put links down in the description below for where you can pick this up for yourself on DriveThruRPG. I think it's a really great example of someone boiling down a bunch of different influences into one consistent system. If I was running something in the old world and I didn't want to use something like a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, which is a really big, thick book, uh, even the new fourth edition, this would be very tempting because it's very fast, it's easy to explain to players, and I could start playing right away. And it has a lot of flavor just baked in there. So if this looks good to you, check it out down below. And thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time.